All right, Luke chapter 3 tonight, Luke chapter 3, we're looking at John's baptism. John's baptism, John the Baptist. What a great man. Let us pray and we'll ask God's help and direction as we begin. Father, thank you so much for uh, your blessing uh, this day. And again, we are so thankful for uh, all of our moms here at Faith Chapel. Uh, mothers are great, great people, and uh, we need them desperately. Uh, we take them for granted, and they do so much for all of us. And so uh, we ask uh, your continued blessing and help for them, strength and energy, uh, a great spirit in you, and uh, victory after victory in their lives. Uh, we ask now tonight as we turn our attention to the book of Luke once again that you would guide us in it. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for this message as we look at uh, John's baptism, uh, a wonderful ministry you gave to this man who was fearless, uh, the, who had the Nazarite vow upon him, and uh, you used him mightily, as we shall see again tonight. So uh, we ask you right now for help and direction, and would you open our eyes to see uh, what you have for us and see even beyond might, what might come out. Uh, in the message tonight. We'll give you the glory for that and the praise because you can do that and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we know very little about the first 30 years of the lives of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. Uh, hardly anything at all. We saw the one really big, beautiful glimpse of our Savior last time at the age of 12, as he went into his father's house and tarried there and mesmerized uh, the teachers and the leaders of the temple. Uh, we know that John began his ministry three months before he was born, as he leapt in his mother's womb when Mary and carrying the baby Jesus walked through the door of uh, Elizabeth's house and what a time that was for them we know that john grew and became strong in spirit as he was being prepared out there in the desert we just don't know uh, much or anything about that at all but we do know that when he bounded onto the stage it was spectacular with tens of thousands of people being affected by his ministry as he prepared the way of the Lord. How long John's aged parents lived, we don't know. It's the same thing with uh, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. We just don't know how long these folks uh, lived on. But we do know that uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth rejoiced greatly in what God did in their lives. And so out in the wilderness, here's John, he is alone with God. His great prophetic personality is being formed and it is being established and so as chapter 3 unfolds before us Luke is going to mention seven names that give us context to what was going on at that period of time and what was going on was darkness was pervading the land let's look at verses 1 and 2 of Luke chapter 3 now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etoria, and of the region of Trochantus, and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So we have a very dark period of time, politically and religiously. I mean, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the rulers of this earth or the religionists who ran the temple and, and the religious things of Israel. It was all dark. It was all corrupt. It was terrible. It was a, a very bad time, so both secular and sacred were no good. Rulers and religionists were both corrupt. It is against this 
horrible dark scene that the word of God comes to John the Baptist. And so we can look at our own time right now and we say to ourselves, it's a dark time in America. But you know what? Just like John the Baptist, God can work and do mighty and great things. And I believe we need to pray for that to happen and trust for God to make that happen. So here comes John. He's bounding onto the stage in his full Nazarite garb. His hair has never been cut. He's wearing a robe of camel's hair and has a leather belt around his waist. And his mere appearance was a call to repentance. And that brings us to our first point tonight, John's preaching, a preparatory baptism. John's preaching, a preparatory baptism. We get a short and concise statement regarding John's ministry here in verse number three. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Three lines in my Bible, but there is, is a lot contained in that little verse. Now, this does not mean that baptism saves. Now, we know that uh, here tonight as believers. Now, there are those that believe that. They believe that their infant baptism will save them. They believe that whatever their baptism was, it will save them. We know that that is not true. John's baptism followed each person's repentance. John was about preaching for repentance. And as they were baptized, it was a sign that they have repented of their sin. That's what this was about. So John was calling the people to repent. In other words, turn away from your sin. That's what this preaching is all about. And their baptism indicated that that is exactly what they did. They turned away from their sin and they came forward to be baptized of John. There was no power in that baptism. It wasn't power. that You, you didn't get any power out of that. Uh, I remember as a, a teenage boy, we had a baptism out in the country. It was in a, a swimming pool, and, and there was an open field, and cars stopped, and were got, getting out and watching what we were doing. And there was a young man who was baptized that night, and I believe he thought that he got some power out of that baptism. When he came up out of that water, man, did he just give a holler and a shout and threw his arms up in the air as if something magical had happened to him. But no, it did not. Uh, what he did was he showed the world, I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and this is a sign of it. So there's no power in the baptism. People repented and they meant it. They really did it. And that's what happens when we are saved. We meant we have turned from this way to that way. We are putting our sin aside and we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. So people repented. They meant it. It was symbolized by their baptism. Well, John preached. And as he preached, of course, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. People were being convicted by the thousands of their sin. His ministry was a powerful, God-ordained and orchestrated ministry. So people were convicted and they repented and they came forward and asked, I want to be baptized. Uh, John's preaching is consistent with Paul's teaching in Ephesians 2 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So John's ministry was powered by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit convicted these people of their sin, and they repented of it, and they went into the waters of baptism. The Holy Spirit gave them the grace to believe the message of John and to repent of their sin. Baptism was a sign of the Spirit-given grace of repentance. 
Repentance is the mark of God's grace working in our lives. Saved souls are repentant souls. If you're saved here tonight, you are still repenting of sin. Well, that didn't stop the moment that we see the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are still repenting of our sin. And that is a great sign that we're walking with the King and he's working in our hearts, and that we are a child of God. A person is in big trouble when they refuse to repent, when they're comfortable in their sin, or even love the sin they are involved in. That person is likely a lost individual. Repenting of known sin, repenting of unbelief, repenting of negative attitudes, repenting of self-centeredness and other sins. It is a sign of our salvation and is also a necessity for our spiritual well-being. We repent. It tears down the wall that we built between the Lord and us because of our sin. And as believers, we confess our sin. We repent of our sin. We get rid of our sin. And our spiritual well-being is wonderful. Well, John preached with incredible Holy Spirit power. Tens of thousands responded. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 to 5 were being fulfilled. I'm going to read those. I have a lot of scriptures I'm going to share tonight. Uh, you don't have to turn to them, but if you can, if you want to. But I'm going to go here to Isaiah 40 verses 3 to 5. They were being fulfilled as John's ministry was unfolding. Isaiah 40, verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now those of you that ever sung the Messiah, that's in there, isn't it? That started to go in my head. <laughs> but I'm going to start singing here. The glory of the Lord. It was being fulfilled. Now look in your Bibles in Luke chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So there it is. It has come to pass. Isaiah 40 verses 3 to 5. When someone important would be coming to one of these big towns, the citizens would get out there and they would construct a smooth, broad highway for them to come and to enter in all of their pomp and circumstance and glory and dignity. So Isaiah's vision here in chapter 40 was a whole lot bigger than just preparing the road for this important person to come to town. Uh, it, it, the, this road was made smooth through the mountains and through the wilderness in preparation for Messiah Jesus to come. The highway John was building was a highway of repentance. Let's get straightened out before our God. He is coming. He was saying, mend your lives. Mend your ways. When you repent, then Christ has full access to work in and through you. Repentance invites the fullness of God. When God's people live repentantly, it opens the way for the world to come to know him. That's when many others will repent and come to Christ. 
Well, John's ministry was used mightily by God, but he also sensed in the crowds that came to hear him that there were hardened hypocrites in that crowd. And you know who they were. They were the religionists. They were the guys that wore the robes. They were the guys that is all about a works religion. Well, times have not changed, have they? Even with millions of professing believers in the United States of America today, there is a great need for repentance and there is a great need for revival in the land. It, it needs to happen in our ranks, the ranks of believing Bible Christians. Well, John saw this easily and he preached very pointedly. That brings us to our second point tonight, John's preaching and authentic baptism. John's preaching and authentic baptism. This will take in verses 7 through 14. We'll, we'll read those as we come to them in the outline tonight. So what does John do right away with these people, these hypocrites, these religious leaders who are way off base? The first thing he does is he turns to eschatology. He warns the multitudes of the great final judgment. Let's look at verses 7, 8, and 9. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So here we see John, he is unafraid. <laughs> not afraid at all. I mean, in, in today's world, they would call him a racist. They would call him a bigot. They would be clamoring for him to be taken out back and beaten to a pulp. That's the way it is. What do you do? He calls the religious leaders vipers. You're a bunch of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes. That's what you guys are. <laughs> Their teaching was poisonous. They were like snakes fleeing from a brush fire, but having no intention in the world to repent of their sin. Nope, we're not going to do that. Jesus is later going to preach the very same thing. And what were these religionists wanting to do with Jesus? Let's kill him. We got to get rid of this guy. So Jesus later preaches the same thing in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 21. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That's a big point. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And these religionists, when Jesus talked like that, they're like, yeah, he's talking about me. Yep, he's talking about me. We've got to do something about him. So these snakes, what do they try to do? They, they try to hide behind their father Abraham in verse number 8. Isn't that what they did? In the middle of verse number 8, they say, we have Abraham to our father. They're always reaching out in the wrong places and with the wrong things. Since we are Jews, we're descendants of Abraham. Since we are that, we're in. 
We don't need you, John the Baptist, talking about all the things you're talking about. Look, we have Abraham's blood in our veins. We're in. And John said, I don't think so, folks. John said, don't think God won't have a people if he cuts you off. God will raise up children right out of the stones that we're standing on right here in the wilderness. God can create children out of these stones right here. Let's look at some more uh, corresponding scriptures. John chapter 8, 31 to 37. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> They bring it back up again. We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son, capital S-O-N, abideth forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Huh, how about that? Let's look also at Romans chapter 4, 16 to 25. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, offenses and was raised again for our justification. And one more verse, Galatians 3.29. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Isn't it neat how things weave together in the word of God? So John, he cuts off their delusion that said that they will be saved because of their connection to Abraham. Your connection to Abraham is not going to save your soul, not at all. Being related to a great Christian does not make you a saved person. And I think people sometimes think that too. I mean, just because my mom and dad were great Christian people, that didn't make me a Christian. I had to receive Jesus Christ for myself. I had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their belief did not hold over to me at all. John follows up with a warning in verse number 9. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. 
Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Uh, once in a while, I'll be driving down through Orchard Company and uh, uh, Country, Company, Country, and uh, you will see where they have cut down all of the old trees that are no longer bearing much fruit at all. What do they do? They drag them together. They pile them up and they burn them. That's kind of the picture uh, that we're seeing here uh, with John. The shiny, sharpened axe lays on the ground beside the root of those whose lives have no good fruit at all. The axe is there and it will cut it down. The judgment is radical severance and destruction. That tree that does not bear fruit, it will be cut down and it will be burned. It will be destroyed. This is a radical severance and it is total destruction. There are many playing the game. They have us fooled. But Jesus says something in Matthew 13, 28 through 30. He said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. God will do the straightening out in the end. You know, uh, I look at, at what's going on in our country today and, and I kind of wonder sometimes, but well, you've got to remember what the Bible says. God's going to sort this out and he will take care of the tares. These individuals who, who, who loot and rape and burn and destroy, God's going to take care of them. They're not going to get away with it Ultimately, they may think they're going to get away with it right now, but they are not going to get away with it at all. John was not looking for popularity. When John preached, he feared no one. And we know, fast forward, he is going to end up uh, with his head on a charger. Not yet. There is more preaching to do. There is more of God's will to do. He's going to preach on. He fears no one. We have to be careful today, and, and we need revival in the pulpits of America. Too much fluff and flattery in the pulpit. Need more preaching on sin, more preaching on salvation, more preaching on the things that we need to be hearing about. Uh, what does the Bible say? Some more scripture here, Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You go back and you know, boy, that's, isn't that what they did? Some of these kings, boy, they were good at promoting and praising the false prophets. Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. The preaching, the message tells you where these people are coming from. John's eschatological warning hit home with many in the crowd. And so they asked him, look at verse number 10, what do they say? And the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? Now, the, the, there were a lot of good people out there who were repenting. They're listening, and they're believing what John had to say, and, he, and they said to him, what shall we do? What should we do? Forget these religionists over here. What should we do? What do we need to do? Well, John's answer was ethical. It, it was not penitential. It was ethical. He said, change how you treat your fellow human beings. You need to change that. People who are lost 
often take up the doing of good deeds or taking up some kind of social cause. That's how I'm going to get into heaven, by doing these things. It's, it's doing for doing's sake. Don't ever get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in doing for doing's sake. Uh, I like what uh, the, the fellow that used to have a, a Roman Catholic uh, ministry, I believe he, he might now be with the Lord, but he had a saying. He always said, he said, he asked these people, how much do you have to do until you're done? How much do you have to do until you're done? Because that's what these, pe that these people are about doing. It's doing, doing, doing. Well, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you did your last good deed and you're going to get into heaven? Nope. But if you are truly saved and repentant, your faith will surely affect how you treat other people. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're walking with him, it will affect how you live. It will affect how you treat other people. If there's no change in personal ethics, I would be very concerned about my salvation. I'm now back in the do camp. I don't want to be there. I'm in the done camp. Jesus has paid it all. It is done. I am done. He is done. It is over. What had to be done has been done. And so John also gave specific advice to three groups of people here. Private citizens, tax collectors, and soldiers. Look at our final three verses, or four, 11 to 14. He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? So here comes the tax collectors. And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded, What a crowd we have here. We've got the normal citizenry. We've got the religious uh, thugs there. Uh, we've got the tax collectors there. And, and there's soldiers there too. Wow, what a crowd. And so, verse 14, And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? He said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Huh. All three have to do with money and material possessions. Citizens, you are to share with others. Tax collectors, do not take more than you ought to be taking from these people. Isn't that why they were hated? They collected the tax and then some. And the, the then some usually was pretty big. And that's how they got filthy rich. So tax collectors... Hey, let's cut that out. Don't take any more than you ought to. Soldiers, do not extort money from people and, and don't be over, uh, over uh, physical with them. Don't go overboard when you're dealing with people. John says a giving spirit is in keeping with his main message of repentance. Repentance goes along with a giving spirit. When we put the sin away, our hearts open up. John gives us some spiritual self-checks here. We could ask three questions. Are we generous with our possessions? Do we enjoy giving to family, friends, and those in need? Do we give regularly and sacrificially to the Lord through the local church? Uh, how do we answer those questions here tonight? Well, the way this happens is the indwelling Holy Spirit in our hearts, he works this out. He makes this happen. You know, I, I've been here 21 years. I've never preached one message on tithing. Most of our people tithe. Most of our people give what they ought to give to the Lord. Personally, I give all my tithe to God through the church. I don't do out there charities and other missionaries and other... That's above and beyond. 
My tithe goes to uh, the work of Faith Chapel, and I believe that's the way it ought to be. Uh, that's how the church goes forward, by doing that. And so we ask ourselves these questions. How does this work? How is it going to happen? Well, it's the indwelling spirit in our heart that makes this happen. And, and it's, been really, it's really been a blessing over the years to watch various people uh, in the congregation of Faith Chapel grow in all of these things. What is that? It's a working of the Holy Spirit in the heart. The, the Holy Spirit changes us. He works in us. He prompts us. He convicts us. And then things begin to happen as we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. What did Jesus say? Recorded in Acts 20, verse 35, Jesus said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Growing Christians live in a constant state of repentance. If you're growing tonight, you are a repentant Christian. You're concerned about your sin, those sins that crop up in your life, and you are constantly in a state of repentance. And we're also in a state of revival, and they go together. These people are guilt-free. They are clear-eyed, and their countenance says to others, Come to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the great words of Scripture that we've looked at tonight. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you might give us that same kind of a, a spirit that uh, the Lord Jesus and, and John the Baptist had in their ministries. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you will do great and mighty things through us as we submit our lives to you, as we repent, as we, as we are revived as we meditate in your word and pray. And, and Father, we ask that you would do a real work of grace in all of our hearts in this church, uh, that, that we would be living and acting and everything that comes from us is like the Lord Jesus himself. That's what we really want deep down inside. And we ask the Holy Spirit that you'll make that happen in all of our hearts and lives here in this church. So, Father, we love you. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. Thank you for John the Baptist. Thank you for the words that you, that you had Luke write down about him and his ministry for our help and our edification. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.